years ago, uh, my husband and I went on a clipper ship cruise, one of those big wood boats, and we went scuba diving. Now, I was certified to, to do scuba in, in college, but my husband was not. And so we took a resort course, which is a short course that you can take. And then the next day you go on a dive. And it was beautiful. I had wonderful memories of it. But I thought that the instructor took us down way too far for a bunch of beginners. And, and my husband was just like, it was great. And I, you know, what, you know, what's the deal? And I said, you know, I practiced those emergency procedures a lot. If something had happened, I'm less likely to panic than somebody who just, you know, just went over them once or twice. You know, you, you practice so that, you know, so that, so that they're, they're ingrained in you. I don't know if you've seen this video or not. It's been, it's been on the internet for a while, but there's a, a pianist playing with an orchestra and the orchestra starts to play and she has this panic look on her face and she says to the, to the, to the conductor, this is not the piece that I practice. Now, I don't know how you do a performance and not have practiced together beforehand, but somehow that's how it was, right? And he just smiled and he goes, yeah, but you know it, right? And you just see her agonize. And then eventually she lifts her finger to the piano and starts to play. Muscle memory, she knew it because she practiced it so much. We hone our skills so that they become part of us. The Israelites were in the desert for 40 years, honing their skills, learning to rely on, on God, unlearning the lessons of slavery, and reclaiming their agency and choosing to follow the God of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar each and every day. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. God humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted in order to make you understand that no one lives by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, those are familiar words, right? Our, our minds will automatically jump to the New Testament with Jesus, who was tempted in, in the wilderness for 40 days by the devil. Devil tempts him to you know, turn the stone into bread, and Jesus responds, we do not live by bread alone. And now, in our scripture passage, John chapter 6, which four weeks of the lectionary in, in, in John 6. So we've had the feeding of the 5,000 plus. Uh, Jesus leaves, the crowd follows, um, saying, wanting more bread. And he says no, and then tells them that he's the bread of life. And then they start complaining against him. And the gospel writer purposefully includes that complaining because it, like everybody reading it, will think back to the Old Testament, to the Israelites, to Moses, complaining uh, of, the, of the people complaining in the desert against God, against Moses. And John, the writer, is saying, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, this is a story about salvation. Just like the Israelites after the Exodus, God saves the people, and then as soon as they experience discomfort, they start complaining. Here in John, in, in the New Testament with Jesus, feeds the people, and as soon as they experience discomfort, they start complaining. Next time somebody says, would you stop complaining? Your response should be, you know, hey, it's tradition. This is what people of God do. And we do it well. No, don't do that. Uh, Jesus has a word for us, to the, to the complainers. Uh, Jesus reminds them and us that God, that God provides. And in this passage links that provision to God's teachings. The word of God is our food. The word of God is Jesus. The word of God is his teachings. Jesus says, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. We come to Jesus to be taught the way of life, to experience life abundant and eternal by following in his way. Our, our faith teaches us, go to Jesus because he has the words of life. Reminds you of Peter, right? Where else would we go? In our anxiety, we turn to the teachings of Jesus. In our fear for the future, we turn 
to the teachings of Jesus. In our anger about the state of things, we turn to the teachings of Jesus. In times of plenty and besides the waters, we turn to the teachings of Jesus so that they are ingrained and become second nature. They become part of us to see us through, to, to keep us faithful and to witness to the power of God. Now, sometime this fall, I hope and I pray, uh, we're gonna get together and we're gonna tell stories. And I'm gonna ask you about the history of this church and you know, what you remember is the most important part. And I'm gonna ask you about happy memories and I'm gonna ask you about the challenging times and I'm gonna ask you when you felt closest to, to God and sometimes it's good to get up on the balcony and take the, the, the bigger, you know, look at the long view of what you've been through together. The church survived the Great Depression. Soldiers were sent off to war. The church almost split over, but didn't. But we did lose some people here because. And yet children were baptized, married. Funerals were held, missionaries commissioned. Scripture has been interpreted and proclaimed by very human and fallible clergy. Sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get in the way. And yet humbly we stand at that table in the bed of Christ and lift up the bread and break it and say, this is my body given for you. Take and eat the bread of life. Proclaiming grace and forgiveness to all of us, despite all the complaining. Looking at our lives, all of our individual lives, we will see moments of joy, times of challenge, uh, times when we ran to God and times when we ran away from God. Into this up and down, windy path, ride the wave of life world, the word of God comes and begs us to follow him so that we might know life. And he provides sustenance for the journey and offers us a feast. If this were a Bible study and a conversation, I would ask us now, all right, in, let's, let's tell each other our stories. When are those times when you faced something in your life and, and a scripture passage came to mind that saw you through? And my guess is we could fill the rest of the hour telling those stories one to another. Uh, what are the Bible verses that you keep in your back pocket? that you bring out when you, when you need them? What are the songs that you sing to yourself when you're just full of joy? God has figured out the four words with me work wonders. I am with you. When in times, different times in my life where I have just, uh, say, facing a Goliath, right, a big giant, and I feel really small, and I'm like, oh, Lord. And those four words come, I am with you. And all my excuses are thrown out the window. And I proceed. Goliath can take different forms. Goliath can be a parenting, a harrowing parenting decision when I'm not sure what is the right thing to do. Goliath can look like the loss of a loved one or challenges at work. Goliath can take the form of a congregation divided by politics which manifests itself in all sorts of wonderful ways. Right? Uh, just, you know, Joe left the church because we started talking, because the pastor talked about Black Lives Matter. Jane left the church because this pastor was silent about Black Lives Matter. Years ago, I was asked to guest preach at a friend's, at a friend's church in Blairstown, the Presbyterian Church. And you don't want to stir the pot while the pastor's away. You know, so you don't want to preach anything really controversial, you know, so, so that you're calling, oh, by the way, you might have to talk to this because I, you know, because I preached on this while you're away. You don't do that, right? So I looked at the lectionary and the passage was about taking care of the earth, which in the past was a no brainer. Everybody, you know, it's a feel good sermon, right? We're going to steward, we are stewards of the earth. We're going to take care of our planet, Right. What I didn't realize that that was the week that, that our former president uh, decided to pull us out of the Paris Accord, right? 
So suddenly my no-brainer, innocuous sermon was political. And when did I realize that? At the back door of the church as people were leaving. And, and, and I, I, I knew everybody's politics by the end, you know? And then I'm calling, David, guess what? You know, I did a stewardship sermon about the earth and, and oops. So uh, the Goliath can be like a congregation that's very, very opinion about what should be talked about or not talked about in church. Goliath is a people divided by misinformation and distrust of one another. Goliath is COVID. What are your Goliaths? And what do you whisper to yourself or what does the spirit whisper to you so that you can stand tall or stand up and get in there and hold your ground or get the heck out of there and do the right thing. Uh, years ago, I, um, I don't say this is, this is ongoing, but it's been a while since I've been in this space, but in recent years, uh, I have found I scared myself with my level of anger, and it's and it's politics. I'm I'm breathing the same air that everybody else is breathing, and I and I'm like, oh Lord, oh, oh, and help, and you know, help me with this. I this you know this is not a good space to be in. Help, and and then the spirit whispers, you know, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute them, which are words of freedom, by the way. I. So, I'm so grateful to God that those words are in Scripture. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And they become a mantra. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And when I'm doing that dance with hate, it, go, it comes into my head, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Persecute you. And I start praying for, for those people. And then I start praying for myself and for all of us. And I'm freed. And the spirit ushers me to a place where I can still look at myself in the mirror with pride as a child of God. The goal is muscle memory, practice, letting the bread of life, the words of life, the word of life become part of us to root in and grow. And the more that we do this, look to Jesus, pray for the spirit, and, and I would counsel, read scripture so that the words of life become our good friends who come visit when we need them. And, and I also want to say that this is an internal work for, for ourselves you know, because, and we see it happens today, it's happened throughout history where scripture, people can weaponize it against other folks. And that's not what, that's not what we're talking about. We're doing the internal work so that, you know, because if we, if we decide that we're going to hold, hold all of us accountable to Scripture and weaponize it one against the other, then none of us stand. So this is for ourselves, so that we can live out these days in faith. And Jesus had words of life for us to meet the most challenging of circumstances with grace and love. So that when the Goliaths appear, we're prepared. Now, if we're going with tradition, when Goliath appears, we complain. But if we're going with Jesus, we face the challenges of life with his words in our hearts and on our tongues and in our actions. He is the bread. He is the word. He is life. May we spend the remainder of our days seeking to be guided by his spirit, learning all that we can and living in harmony with ourselves. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, and you might find this ironic, but it's a Gandhi quote. And he said, joy or happiness is when what we think and what we say and what we do are in harmony. Come to Jesus, believe in Jesus, learn from Jesus, act like Jesus. And may the Spirit of God cover all that we say and do with grace. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen.